you know, the History Center offers all these programs um, and many others during the year, and we really would um, like to encourage as many of you that are not members of Brookside Museum to join. Membership is a, it starts at $25 for uh, seniors and uh, goes up from there, but uh, it, we count on the volunteers and the membership in order to be able to put on these programs for you. So you may have seen Andrew, you may have, rec Andrew, you may have received the brochure on membership. We would really encourage you, if you're not a member, to become a member. So now, enough about me. I think you'd like to actually hear from the speaker tonight. So we're going to go ahead and move to talk about uh, Lauren Roberts. And we'll introduce her now. Lauren Roberts is the Saratoga County historian. She reserved, received her dual bachelor's degree in anthropology and American studies from Skidmore College before going on to earn her master's degree in public history from the University of Albany. Lauren worked locally in the field of archaeology before becoming county historian in 2009. She co-produced the documentary, Harnessing Nature, Building the Great Sacandaga, which chronicles the creation of the Sacandaga Reservoir. She is co-host of the WAMC podcast, A New York Minute in History, along with New York S uh, State historian Devin Lander. Most recently, she was a member of the team that developed our current exhibit on black experiences in Saratoga County, which you had to pass as you came to this room. And uh, afterwards, we'd uh, really enjoy if you were able to take a, a closer look at that exhibit. And Lauren also currently chairs the Saratoga County Committee on the Rev War 250 anniversary celebration. And that's just the things we're going to talk about. She does much more than that. But we'd like to welcome Lauren Roberts for a presentation. Tonight. Jim. Good evening, everyone. Um, glad to see so many people in the audience. I haven't given an in-person presentation here at Brookside since before 2020, so it's great to be back. Great to see actual faces. Um, great to see uh, or be seen on the screen as well for all of you at home. But um, I'm, I'm Lauren Roberts. Thanks, Jim, for such a great introduction, and thanks to both the Round Table and the Saratoga County History Center for all the great things they do for our local history. Um, it, it really is nice to, have, to live in a county that recognizes the importance of local history. Um, I'm grateful to work for underneath the Saratoga County Clerk, Craig Hainer, who um, has great respect for our records and part of the reason that we are able to do a lot of research and talk about things like the poorhouse is because we have these records to go back into and look at. So um, if you haven't uh, been on our site, our Saratoga County website, um, Craig Hainer has made it possible for millions of our records to be accessible online. Uh, we have all of our land records online back to 1791, which was the beginning of the county. Um, we have civil actions, uh, index to civil actions, not the actual cases, but the index, so you can look through and see um, what, what a litigious society we've had since the beginning, um, but lots of interesting cases, uh, immigration such as naturalization records, uh, they're all available to you online, so please feel free to go on our website, saratogacountyny.gov, under the county clerk, and use those records. I'm a records person. Uh, I really love, you know, when you see books that, that look like this and they have that musty smell. You know, that's what really gets me excited. I'm sure some of you in the audience have that same, that same feeling when we see these books. So tonight, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the Saratoga County Poorhouse. And I'm just wondering, how many in the audience remember the poorhouse? It was here until 1961. Okay, so there's a couple of you. How many of you, before you saw the advertisement for this presentation, didn't know that we had a poorhouse? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's only been gone for about, you know, 60 years, uh, 70 years, so not that long in our history. Well, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad you're ready to learn. So let me oh, make sure that my technology works. Hey, how about that? Okay, so... Um, talking about the beginning of the county, I just mentioned Saratoga County began in 1791. Before that, we were part of Albany County. Um, so early poor laws really revolved around 
outdoor relief versus indoor relief. So outdoor relief would be supporting someone with um, financial, monetary, food, it, wherever they were. Whereas indoor relief is in an institutional setting. And big um, urban areas usually had almshouses. Uh, or sometimes they're called poor houses, houses of industry. Uh, they're all kind of used interchangeably. Uh, but, but there were some of them, but really in our area, not too many. Uh, the ways that we cared for the poor before the 1820s, each town was really responsible for their own poor. And so that, um, there are several ways here. We did have some public almshouses. Um, outdoor home relief, I mentioned, was um, where you were located. The contract system, uh, people would sign a contract saying that they would support a pauper in their private home for a certain amount of money, tax money, to be paid to them for the support of paupers. Maybe they had them living in their barn. Maybe they had an extra room in their house. The auction system, they would uh, auction basically paupers to the lowest bidder. Whoever would take care of them for a lo the lowest amount of money, um, they would be able to then sign the contract to get them. Um, and then apprentice programs, you can see here are some early indentures um, from 1824, the top one, Laura Gibbs, four years old. And she's going to be uh, warned out to Samuel Hogue until she turned 18 years old to be taught the craft, mystery, and occupation of housekeeping. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago that I had a four-year-old daughter she could not keep my house clean. I would not leave that to her. But, you know, and, yeah, yes. Um, and what does she get at the end? One good new suit of holy day clothes and two good suits for everyday wear and one Bible. Um, you know, when you turn 18, and there you are. There you go. Um, uh, this other one, right, from 1826, Seth, uh, Summerfield Seth Murray, three years old. He's going to be taught... Um, to be a miller until the age of 21. So this was a, a common way. It was really indentured servitude. Um, what were the problems with this? Well, I'm sure you can imagine. Um, you know, being auctioned off to the lowest bidder, there's really no control over um, how well they were clothed, how well they were fed, how hard they were worked. Um, and also, the cost, right? The cost came back on the towns. So um, a, lot of, a lot of people felt that there, there was a high cost to this style of caring for the poor. So uh, the other problem, the state poor law of 1788, um, really they wanted to fight over residency. Where did that pauper come from? If that pauper walked across the boundary from the town of Saratoga to the town of Stillwater and then needed public relief, what do you think they were going to do? You're not our responsibility. The taxpayers of the town of Saratoga are going to pay for you. Um, so, th so that was a problem. Never ending fights over who's responsible for this person. So in 1823, um, really in the 1820s, there's, there's um, a call for reform of these laws. And we have something called the Yates Report. The Secretary of State, John Yates, was in charge of putting together a report to try to review this type of a system and find out what the problems were. One of the things that he did was reach out to current town supervisors. Ooh, sorry, it's dark. Here's some, here's some of the quotes. I can read these. So these are some of the uh, supervisors who re responded to him. Um, the first one we have for the town of Providence, a uh, rural area in the northern part of the county. thought I had it larger here. We have tried the experiment of putting some of our paupers into a house of industry, but we couldn't maintain them so cheap as by proposals and contracts with individuals. Our paupers have generally been of that class who were unable to labor, and many of them require constant attention. Uh, so here, another distinction they make is between worthy poor and unworthy poor. So when he's saying here, of that class who were unable to labor, though they're considered worthy poor, um, the elderly, the sick, 
children. Um, they, you know, they really needed public relief through no fault of their own. The unworthy poor were considered to be able-bodied, but they didn't work. It was some fault of their own that they were not good members of society and not able to care for themselves. So they do make a distinction between these two types of poor. Moving on to Corinth. Um, yes, I say Corinth. Uh, my, my dad's family is from Corinth, so that's how, <laughs> that's how I will always pronounce it. Um, there is no poorhouse in our town, nor any county poorhouse. I think it would subserve the cause of humanity and be less burdensome on community to have the paupers supported wherever they might chance to be, as generally speaking, much of the expense attached to their support is paid in transporting them and in appeals, etc. So he's referring here to trying to push them back to wherever they came from you, for your town. And they go on to say, um, you know, in Charlton, he's saying, you know, I think that a county poorhouse would remedy many of the evils of the present system and would be a savings. And really, that's what, what um, John Yates found, too, that they felt they would be better able to control um, the quality of care that paupers were getting in a common house setting and that it would be less expensive to be able to care for them. Now, Stillwater, they had their own poorhouse in town recently, and there were a couple different towns that had that. Um, there is a, the town of Ballston had created one in the 1820s, and I think they went, um, they were partners with Milton on that too. Uh, and the, the town of Stillwater, um, they really thought that county houses were, were a good idea, and they had really seen some benefits from having their own poorhouse. Um, and this is what the town of Stillwater historian, uh, historian, supervisor says, after he's noting here. In closing these remarks, I would observe that from 15 years' experience in the management of town concerns, having audited and examined the accounts of the poor masters, witnessed the operation of our present system, and experiencing the exertions and expedients to throw the paupers from the towns to the counties under the above statute, and knowing from observation the habits and dispositions, views and wishes of the people, I'm convinced the present law, meaning the earlier law, is defective that its provisions invite to pauperism, and that the best and perhaps only corrective of the evil will be found in county houses of industry. So the supervisors were generally in support of it. And in 1824, New York comes out with the poor law. And they require counties to build their own poor houses. Now, there were other states that um, had the, where counties had the ability to build their own poor houses. New York's the only state that requires it. Um, they appointed, there's several other things. They appointed the superintendents of the poor, which were employed by the town, and then the keeper of the poor house by the county. Um, it wasn't so popular to the people. Why do you think that was? They didn't want to pay for it. They didn't want to build a house. They didn't want to buy the land and pay for it. They thought that it would be cheaper. So in the laws, if you see in the middle, if any proof were wanting of the unpopularity of the law for erecting county poorhouses, it would be found in the sentiments expressed by the numerous meetings which have been held on the subject in this county. So they see on the left-hand side, I have circles. In the law of New York, they did exempt some counties. So what did Saratoga County do? Well, we want to be exempted. We are requested to state that a meeting of the inhabitants of the town of Saratoga Springs will be held. They held at Wheeler's Columbian Hotel but they wanted to request to be exempted from the law so they didn't have to build a county house. And, in fact, they were in 1825. However, what was rendered to exempt? Um, they, they passed, they, you're talking about the counties yes. being exempt? I think they just had to petition the state and they would want to be excluded from the law and they were going to continue the old way of caring for the poor. Mm -hmm. okay. But in 1826, here they are building a county poorhouse. So even though they were able to be exempted, they still the following year went on to build it. What happened? Why the change? Um, the state held the mortgage. There was a change in the way that they were able to borrow the money to build or buy the farm, the house, that that was going to be used. So. They go and they buy Mr. Hugh Hawkins' farm. 
one mile and a half west of Balsam Spa as a county poorhouse. It's a 112 acre parcel. Um, this lot is now where the current jail, animal shelter, um, recycling center, fire training, that parcel is basically the same parcel. There are a couple uh, acres along the side that have been added, but in general, it's this original parcel, which was purchased in 1826 from Hugh Hawkins. He had a farmhouse there. They expanded it. So uh, the, there was an original farmhouse, two-story farmhouse, and they built wings down the side, put basements underneath them. Um, there are articles in the newspaper describing the new, the new house, and it was opened in um, September, around September of 1827 to begin um, taking in people. You can see here on the Burr map of 1829 where the red arrow is, the location of the county poorhouse. Um, so this picture is um, it's in our collection. It has been talked about as possibly the original almshouse, um, and, you, and you may have seen it in some places. I, I don't believe this is the original almshouse because it doesn't match the description of the, of the house in the newspaper that they talk about with the long wings down either side, the, the wood um, huts at the end. There doesn't appear to be a basement. This picture is taken later. Um, it's obviously a, an old house at this point, but you can see up here is a power line right there. Here's a tractor in the background. So um, this is a picture is taken later, but it is an early house. I think it probably was an early building on the property, but not the poor house itself. Um, that and you'll see why later. But I, I think this may have been used as the pest house. Um, so, and the, the pest house would be uh, if, they, if there was a, a contagious, an illness, um, you would have to stay in the pest house so that you didn't spread. Yeah, quarantine, exactly. You would be quarantined in the pest house so that not everybody else caught your illness. Um, and, and later on, they used it as a summer dwelling. Um, the first record we have as to numbers for the inmates is the 1830 federal census. Daniel Colomer is the alms house keeper, and you can see um, 89 inmates in the poorhouse. That's a pretty big number, 89 for 1830. 30 males and twice as many females. Um, Ten years later, in the 1840 census, Daniel Colomer is still there as the alms house keeper. 115 inmates, um, white males, white females, and in this sense, they separate out people of color. <laughs> um, there certainly, there certainly was um, crowding in the house. Uh, I think it goes along with institution. Anyone who is institutionalized is an inmate. <coughs> Moving into the 1850s, um, we've got a little bit more information. Oh, I just mentioned here, Daniel Colomer is the alms housekeeper. Uh, I did bring uh, a couple record books here that we have. This book in particular is opened to um, the page on Daniel Colomer. Um, the, this book is an account book of the expenses of the poorhouse, probably kept by the county treasurer. And um, in this book, you see Colomer, what he's being paid for his salary as the poorhouse keeper. Also, it notes that his daughter was the schoolhouse teacher. Um, so at this point in, in time, all of the um, Anyone who needed aid, who could not care for themselves, they were all lumped in together in the poorhouse. So people of all ages, um, people with disabilities, people who were blind, um, epileptics, um, infirm, elderly, they're all, this is, this is kind of the catch-all and everyone's kept together. Um, so here, this is the 1856 map of Saratoga County. You can see here there's an addition of uh, the schoolhouse right next to here. This is Alms House here, S H C 
stands for schoolhouse. So they built a separate house that was the schoolhouse in the 1850s. Um, you can see the numbers are going up, right? Our population is going up, industrial revolution, right? We're having um, more people coming in as tourists. Uh, 1852, 322. By 1855, 498 people have gone through the poor house within a year. That's not saying that 500 people are living in that one house. Um, it was really a transient population in the poor house. Not everyone stayed there for a long time. Um, if you look at the uh, economy here and the weather here, uh, we had a large seasonal population, people who could find work in good weather in the summertime when all of the hotels were open, when there was a big tourist industry. And then in the wintertime, it was harder to find work. Uh, so they could have been coming into the poor, they would have been going into the poor house in the winter when they couldn't, when they didn't have enough heat um, and they couldn't feed themselves in the winter, and then they would go out in, the, in June, better weather, where they could find jobs. Um, you see here that there is a, um, this information is, is taken from the Board of Supervisors proceedings, and they are, um, they talk about the school, they talk about how many numbers. So you can see up at the top, 220 people February 17th, I'm guessing that's one of the coldest days of the year, usually, you know, middle of February. And then 85 or 6 in the middle of August. So you could, that's a, quite a fluctuation in the poor house. Um, and then the school, they talk about the school being kept. Um, they talk down here, the tiny stuff that you can't read talks about the farm. So they did have an active farm. It was important to keep the able bodied people working to help support themselves. They had gardens, they had a hog house, they had horses, um, they had teams that were, they were growing crops. Um, you can see they're growing buckwheat, potatoes, oats, corn, hay, uh, an abundance of vegetables for the supply of the house. So part of them, uh, the people who were able to work, that's not to say that you know, people who couldn't work um, were there also, but the ones who could work ran the farm, and it was a full farm. Towards the end of the 1850s, we see the numbers growing. The house is getting older. There's a report on, on county poorhouses in the state of New York that talks about the inspection of this, uh, of our poorhouse. And uh, they talk about how out of repair this house was. I'm just going to read a little piece of it. This house is an old one and badly dilapidated. The rooms are low, sadly out of repair. And the air in the sleeping rooms is most foul and noisome. It is very well attended, however, by the present keeper and is kept in as good order as possible. Corporal punishment is administered to men, women, and children. But if they were bound out eight during the year, mm -hmm. on trial, the money that they would earn Um, if they were bound out, then they would, usually the person that was taking them would be paid to keep them. So they weren't making any money. So how did anyone ever escape the situation? Um, well, the ones that, the hope was that the people who were able-bodied would be able to get a, a job, to find employment, and then be able to su sustain themselves. Uh, and then we see here the, the causes of pauperism also. Sorry. 1860s, not much has changed. Uh, there's a clear need for a newer, larger poor house. Uh, the county poor house is still noted here and the um, schoolhouse. So finally in 1872, the Board of Supervisors passes a resolution allowing for the building of a new poor house to meet the needs of our growing population. And in 1973, the house is built. Um, it's, it was actually a beautiful structure. Um, it was quite large, meant to hold between 150 and 200 people. Um, they, there was, I think I have a, probably have a better picture. Let me just go forward. Um, this would be if you're coming up the road. Actually, now there are t only two, two trees left at the very entrance 
but it kind of followed a straight path, and then the, the poor house is basically where the animal shelter is now. Here's another uh, kind of a side view. Um, and it, it was, yeah, it was big. The, the main, the center area was kind of the administration. That was actually three stories that had a mansard roof and a basement. Uh, and then there were two wings, the men's wing and the women's wing. They were kept separate, although there is noting of uh, the dangers of them co-mingling when they were working on the farm. Um, but they were sep kept separately inside. The um, kitchen, dining room, they were down in the basement. Um, and there was, there's noted that there was an outdoor area for people who, um, for, for the mentally ill, where they could exercise outside. Uh, there is, uh, you know, th the conditions there were difficult, especially when people had conditions that, um, that the keeper couldn't, they didn't know how to treat. And around this time period, mid-1800s, you start to see um, specialization of institutions to be able to treat different types of people. Um, in the 1860s, you see the, the Willard Asylum open, and so people who were mentally ill are being sent to the Willard Asylum. Um, in 1875, the state passes a law saying children can no longer be kept in county poorhouses. They need to be kept in a facility where they are going to learn edu have education, learn um, more good morals, so they're removed from the poorhouse and sent to different institutions. Working. Mostly. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there were, um, you know, a, as, as the, they learn more about conditions, as treatments are developed, you have things like the Craig Colony, which was specific to epile epileptics. So people who had epilepsy could then be sent to the Craig Colony. Now the county would continue to pay for those people in those asylums. They, they called them asylums, institutions, as they came out. So they're really starting to peel away layers of the uh, poor population that needed more specialized treatment. Uh, so here's a look at, um, this is actually a Sanborn fire insurance map from the 1890s. You can kind of get a sense of how big the, the complex was. Here, down here is the main building. So you can see it's kind of like on three sides. This is the administrative front. Here's the men's wing. Here's the female ward. Um, and then in the back, back here, you have all of the barns, the stockyard, the hog yard, the slaughterhouse over here, storage sheds. This is the boiler house. Um, they talk, I, I should say there are several reports, um, yearly reports that are done, some by the State Board of Charities, who uh, really it was the state that was making a lot of mandates. Um, but also the County Board of Supervisors would come out once a year and inspect the poorhouse. Here's a picture, um, this is kind of a, a better picture from the back side. So you're, you're looking, it would be south. Um, this is the back of the building. You can kind of get a, a better idea of how large it was. This is from the side. I, I don't know for sure. I think this covered area here might have been what they were referring to for um, like outdoor recreation exercise. These are some of the barns. I mean, it was, it was really a big complex. Uh, and you can imagine, right, if you had a, approximately 100 to 150 people there. Now, not all of them were working the farm. Um, a, a large part of the population by this time are elderly people because they've, they've taken off, you know, no more children here. Um, mentally ill were in a different place. So, um, and, and I should say at the same time, they were still using outdoor relief. There was still people that were, um, that were able to house themselves that only needed help in the winter time, that needed food. They were still doing that. Um, then not everybody was in the poorhouse. And the poorhouse was someplace you didn't want to go. And there was, um, you know, they, they struggled for a balance between showing compassion to people who really needed help and not making it too comfortable so that people would want to rely on the system. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Lauren Thorne, was residency there voluntary, involuntary? 
Who made the decision to send them? It's a good question. Um, so the towns employed um, superintendents of the poor. And those people were the ones that recommended whether they should go to the poorhouse or not. Um, they, they would determine whether they needed outdoor relief or indoor relief. So it would have been up to them. There were also physicians that would have um, made those decisions that worked both for the town and they did employ a physician at, at the poorhouse. Um, but I did see, so I would say mostly it's voluntary. You only go there because you know you really need to go. You, there's no other place for you to go. Um, but you do. There are instances of people running away from the poorhouse. Uh, so, and and um, I don't think they were brought back. There may have been. There's a lot of references to intolerance. So people were there because of alcoholism. Um, they may have been uh, sent there for a specific amount of time, and then they were able to leave. Um, but but I would say voluntary. Yeah. Voluntary. Uh, in 1903, uh, there was there was a call among the states to have a separate area for the the sick and the elderly to be placed away from those in the poorhouse. So so this would be right the worthy poor people who couldn't work. Um, and in 1903. Horace Carpentier donated this building fully supplied for um, an infirmary. And it's right next to this, the main building. Here's, here's the main poorhouse here. This is the infirmary separated. Anybody recognize the name Horace Carpentier? He actually donated um, another facility for the county. So he uh, grew up in Providence and he donated the homestead, it was his homestead, which became our tuberculosis hospital in the early 1900s, about the same time. Um, and there is some confusion sometimes when people are doing research. This is the Carpentier Infirmary, the one in Barkersville, which became our tuberculosis hospital, we refer to as the Saratoga County Homestead, both donated by the same person. Um, so here's kind of, you know, the, the, the picturesque looking, uh, this is taken a little bit from the side, um, but you can see how big of a complex it was. It was a, quite a beautiful building, and in the early 1900s, really the, the, the main portion of the population that you have left are the elderly. Um, they've kind of uh, taken away other population. Okay, so records. What we have, we have the poorhouse admission book beginning in 1893 and going to 1938. It's the only admission book we have for the poorhouse. And it was purchased in 1999 from the auction site eBay and returned to the Saratoga County Historian's Office. Um, Victoria Garlando was the one who found it on eBay and Alice Zetterstrom uh, actually bought the record and returned it to the county historian's office. Um, we are grateful to people who find um, fugitive records. Fugitive records is the term you use for records that have gone out from an institution to which they belong, like the county. Um, how did they get away? We don't know. Um, it, it could have been, uh, you know, we didn't have re records retention um, that early on. We do now to know how long we had to keep records. Um, people worked out of their homes. They could have been in a home office. Uh, they, they could have been discarded. Once these people were out of the poorhouse, the county was no longer financially responsible for them. It may have been that they didn't feel that the records were necessary to keep. Um, so I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that they were stolen. Uh, there's lots of reasons that, that they could have gotten away from the county. But we are, are grateful <laughs> for people who help us get those records back because these certainly are valuable records. And I will also say there are, there are actually two books that came back. Um, the first is this one, that, uh, the scan I'm showing on the screen, which is the poorhouse admission records. The second is um, a record of children and other persons committed to asylums or hospitals from Saratoga County. So uh, remember that I said after 1875, they had to send the children out to appropriate institutions um, 
that book, which covers roughly the same time period, was bought back at the same time from the same people. Um, and actually, more recently, the book I mentioned before, The Accounts from the Treasure, which actually start back in the 18, late 1820s when the poorhouse was first built, um, that was also recently purchased back um, at, within the last 10 years or last five years, um, for also from an auction. Uh, and, and you know, eBay is a two-edged sword, right? I mean, we see these types of records that we may not have seen if they were in an auction house in New York City, but now that they're online, we can see them. On the other hand, there's a monetary value now associated with these types of records. And people who may otherwise have said, well, these are old books, um, I don't want them anymore, I'm gonna donate them to a local historical record repository like the county historian, like Saratoga County History Center. Now instead of donating them, they know that they're worth money. So they may you know, choose to, uh, to put them on an auction site instead. So, so good and bad come with, <laughs> come with a place like eBay. <laughs> yeah, this book in particular was a little over two hundred dollars, two hundred thirty. Yes. Um, wondering how much the book cost. The book was about two hundred and thirty dollars to buy back. The other one was a similar price. Which in in nineteen ninety nine is quite a bit of money. Uh, it's still quite a bit of money for a book. <laughs> um, here's the type of information that, that it um, tells us. I'm going to move along here. You guys don't want to be here all night. Um, the type of information, the names, the nationality, um, the date that they were taken in, where they came from, and then the end of it, I'll just zoom in here, discharge information. This can be really in interesting. Um, in the discharge column, which is the one at the end, it tells us if, if they were taken by someone, it could be a relative, it could be that they were gonna work for them. Um, it'll tell us the name and sometimes the address of where these people were being placed. Um, this is a, a scan, and you guys can come up and look at this book um, afterwards if you'd like to. I have it opened just to a, a random page. But um, these are the records of people who, um, who were wards, basically, of the county, and we sent them out to other institutions. Um, this just showing the different types of institutions that they were being sent to. For instance, we have some local institutions here. Saratoga House for Children. It has a different name now, the Holly Home. And you know, also Saratoga Hospital. So it wasn't just you know, it wasn't just orphanages. If people needed more care than what the county poorhouse could provide, they would be sent to hospitals. Also, um, a lot of people ask where did most of the children go? Um, Albany and Troy had the large orphanages, and that's where most of our children seem to have gone, judging by these records, at least in this time period. Uh, just a <laughs> reference, you know. These children sometimes were returned for bad behavior or um, other things. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, but also, you know, they, they were in a lot of times temporarily, maybe in the wintertime. And then you'll see in the discharge information that they were um, returned to their mother. Um, so maybe she couldn't afford in the wintertime when she didn't have work to feed them or to um, clothe them, shelter them. So the children would go in for a temporary time and then uh, maybe when the mother had work again, she would come in and get the children back. Um, you can see main cause of all of these children being here is destitution. Uh, in general, the, the largest portion, they, they were here because of, because of poverty. Oh, and these are just showing the Saratoga Home for Children. Um, so uh, it, this is a, from 1932. It's actually an insurance survey, so we know, you know what, what it's looking like in the early 1900s. Um, you can see that the complex is still there. Uh, not much has changed except that, you know, from the last time the hospital's been added. Here's the hospital over here. 
Um, all the barn complexes are still here. It was still a working farm at that time. Um, you can see these are pictures that were taken in the 1930s of the complex. You can see now we have automobiles. <laughs> Um, but, but the farm was still, you know, it was still going. These pictures were taken probably in the 40s, maybe the 50s. Um, this, this is the kitchen and the dining room in the basement. Um, and we are uh, lucky, I am lucky. I wrote a small article about Christmas at the Poor House um, for the Saratoga County History Roundtable um, back in Christmas, Christmas-ish, December, um, uh, about, uh, there's, there's a story about um, that the keeper actually brought in a Christmas tree and had a present for every one of the um, people that were staying in the poor house. It was a nice article. And um, Sarah Welch, who's here tonight, um, brought up that, that her grandmother was a cook at the, um, at the county home in the 1940s and 50s probably the last cook who was there, and mentioned that um, she remembered as a little girl going and helping her grandmother um, pass out cookies to the residents. And it just so happened that Sarah still had the recipe um, that her grandmother used as a cook for these cookies. They're molasses cookies. And she was kind enough to share it with me and although I had some questions like, what is sour milk? And um, baking salt, is that the same as kosher salt or baking soda? Um, she was kind enough to help me with that. Uh, so thank you, Sarah. And I have made the Poor House cookies. They're in the back. Uh, I encourage you to try them. I fed them to my children last night. They're still alive. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so thanks again, Sarah. I love to hear, you know, Anybody who has reminiscence or family members that were in the poorhouse, you know, this type of research is ongoing always. And I'm always looking for more information. There's always more records to check. Um, so if any of you have information or are interested, you know, feel free to contact me. <laughs> I wasn't smart enough to know cut everything down and not let it fall. <laughs> so Sarah is, is saying that the, um, the quantities were not specific. The bottom line was just add flour. So she was able to feed the whole neighborhood with the first batch that she made and that before she ended up cutting it down. Um, so thank you, Sarah. I hope you enjoy the cookies. Just more pictures of the interior. This would have been the hall where the, um, guests could come. They could have visitors. And um, those lovely, luxurious showers next to it. I guess they would be considered because um, when the poorhouse started, um, they didn't have any bathing facilities. And actually, in 1902-03, um, Saratoga County was commended for a new practice because previously practices in other county poorhouses were that the inmates had to share towels once they bathed. And Saratoga County in 1902 instituted a new policy that each inmate got his own clean towel on bathing day. So, yes. <laughs> um, here's a picture of what the, the later infirmary looked like. Um, you can see it's, it's been closed in in the front. The porch has been turned into kind of a solarium. Um, and the reason I put this on is because after um, the, the 19, I'll say 30s, really the major part of the population was, uh, was elderly. And it was treated more of a home for the aged, actually. You see that, that terminology used in the 1930s. And um, at the end, they were living, at, at the end of when the poorhouse really wasn't being used that much anymore, for 150 pe people, it was mostly vacant, um, there were 10 residents left in 1960. And in 1960, um, remember I mentioned Horace Carpentier had, um, had donated the TB hospital. Well, in 1960, the TB hospital closed uh, because we had developed antibiotics. We didn't need that anymore. It closed as a TB hospital. They renovated it and reopened it in 1961 as the county 
um, home for the aged. And these last 10 patients that were located here were transferred to the homestead up in Barkersville. And that was the, the end of the poorhouse. And then in 1961, all of these buildings were torn down. Just a final note. Um, no one has asked about um, the poorhouse cemetery. Where were they buried? Um, well, from the early 1820s until 1915, it was common practice to bury them on the property. Where's the cemetery? I don't know. Um, we don't know. We don't have the records. We know they were buried there uh, because it, it's listed in um, some death certificates. Actually, you'll see buried on the county farm. Back um, in 2016, 17, uh, you may know that we built, the county built a new public safety building, um, which is located kind of in front of the jail. Public health is also there. Some, some of you may have gone there to get your COVID vaccine. Um, so when that, before that building was being built, we knew that there was a possibility that the cemetery could be located in any of those areas. And so um, we worked with an archeologist to test those areas prior to um, building anything on that spot so that if there was something there, we would, we would be able to avoid it. I'm showing you here, uh, these are the transects that the archeologist um, investigated so here, here's the main road right here. Uh, this is County Farm Road. You come to that stop sign here, and you would go straight into here. Here's the animal shelter. Here's the jail. This is the area where the public safety building is now, and this is the area that was tested. They also tested this additional area here. We have um, slight evidence um, that we think maybe there are maybe the cemeteries in this area. We really don't know. And since they stopped in 1915, the earliest aerial imagery we have is 1940s, and it doesn't show any um, markers that we can really see. It would have been common for them to have like a stake with a number on it, or maybe a wooden cross. Those things could have rotted away. Um, they definitely would have kept records because they wouldn't want to um, you know, find, uh, accidentally find someone when they were digging a new grave. Um, we just don't have those records now. Or if they do exist, I, I don't know of them. If any of you have them at home, <laughs> give me a call. We can keep it confidential. Um, but, but I just want you to know that you know we are looking for the cemetery. And before any other buildings go up there, if, if that rest of that property is developed, we'll continue to do archaeology to make sure that we're not disturbing that cemetery. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I ran long. <laughs> I don't know if we have time for questions or we have to. I can I can repeat them. Okay. Kate. So I think um, that mothers were kept with children of either. I'm sorry. Thank you, Sean. Um, the question is, were there accommodations for families? Um, because they were, the sexes were kept separate. I think the mothers would have, the children would have stayed with the mother. The father, I don't know. I think they were probably separated, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, and, and that's the other thing, right, that 1875 law where they, they, children can no longer be kept there after they were like two or three years old. Um, it's great that they were being educated and in a, a better institution, but the, the backside of that is they were separated from their families. So. Yep, go ahead. Um, yes. There, he said when, when the brick building was built in 1873, was there indoor plumbing? Um, I think there, if, if not right in the beginning, it did come not too far after that um, because they do install things like electricity and a steam laundry. They talk about that in the reports. They really needed laundry facilities so that everybody could have their own towel. Um, so I would say, you know, within uh, maybe a, a decade or, or so, there would have been in, indoor plumbing.
Yes, sir. What's the route to get in here where a person voluntarily goes to the courthouse or to the courthouse or somebody that said, I want to get in? How does that work? So he's asking, how do you get to the poorhouse if you need the help? Um, the towns, the individual towns had something called superintendents of the poor. And you would go to your individual superintendent of the poor and say, I need assistance. Um, and then that, that man, man, usually man, would determine um, whether you just needed outdoor relief or whether you were a candidate to be um, put, sent to the poorhouse. And then that person would then recommend to the keeper of the poorhouse um, they need to they need to go be admitted to the poorhouse. Mm -hmm. In the first slide, when you were talking about kids, the first one and the little girl, was, it said that um, the man was paid forty dollars. Um, the man who took the boy in was that for a year or was that for the time of the indenture? So she's asking, um, in the beginning slides, the, the, with the young children, it said the man was paid $40. Um, I don't know whether it was the three-year-old or the four-year-old. That would have been the whole sum um, for, from when they were three until uh, sometimes 18, sometimes 21. I know they talk about in the 1850s, the cost for the county to have an in, uh, inmate in the poorhouse for one week was about 93 cents. Uh, so the, the superintendents of the poor would have been the, sorry, um, asking how, if anybody ever checked up on, on uh, people, children who were bound out or people who were contracted out. Uh, I think the superintendents of the poor, that would fall under their jurisdiction to be checking on them. I don't think it was a really regimented type, you know, it wasn't systematic, you know, once a week we're going to check on them. I'm sure that there were instances where children were taken out of deplorable situations, um, but I don't, I, you know, we all have different levels of deplorable. So. Go ahead. You said that uh, when they decided that they were not going to treat any, any people who have mental illness in the village, is that the village in Seneca? Is that the village? Uh, she's wondering uh, about the Willard Asylum. Uh, when the um, people who, were, who had um, mental illness were sent out. Yes, it's the Willard Asylum out in Western. Uh, it's, I don't know, I don't think, is it still open? No, it's not still open, the building's there. Yeah, yeah, right. The New York State Museum acquired several suitcases from the attic of that building and developed an exhibit uh, based on the, the, the material culture that those patients left behind and, and they were able to kind of tell the stories of those patients. It's a wonderful exhibit. Um, I think you, is it online, John? Well, I'm not sure. I don't know. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, it's out in, in western New York. So she's saying Seneca Lake. Yeah. But there, you know, there was a feeling at the time that um, institutionalizing uh, was, a, was a good thing, would help people that you could, um, it, especially you could take away temptation when you institutionalize someone and you could reform character. Um, we don't really feel that way anymore, but that was the way that they felt. They, they, I, I believe that they felt that they were helping people that needed help, and they don't have the same information that, and that's not for everybody. There's always bad apples, right? Um, but, but I, I, I believe that they were trying to do the right thing to help help people, and that they, you know, they just, as they learned more about treatments and um, diseases, illnesses, you know, they, they changed the model. Go ahead. He's asking, was all assistance public or was there private assistance as well? Yes, there was private assistance. Um, I read a, an article about um, a, a widow who is 83 years old and her church was um, 
uh, paying for her to be boarded one dollar a week so that she didn't have to go to the poor house. Um, so I think churches were were instrumental in in private relief. And then you know once the church ran out of money, she she had to go to the poor house. That's the article that I read. But yeah, I th I think there was certainly um, private donors and especially churches were involved um, in in helping people that needed it. Anyone else? Um, it's, it's a good question, and I don't think enough research has been done on Horace Carpentier. He grew up here, um, and he made his money during the time of the gold rush in California. He went out to California, but he didn't make his money from gold. He made it from, it's, it, um, and I haven't done this research myself, so this is what I've read. Um, um, land speculation was how he made his money and maybe not honest land speculation. Um, and he came back, and when he came back, he had a lot of money. He actually created, um, I'm going to mess up the name, but in Columbia University, there was a um, specific study of, uh, for Chinese. He actually brought back with him a, a Chinese, some say a servant, probably a friend later. Um, he, may, he worked for him to begin with. Um, and uh, he did a lot of philanthropy at the end of his life when he came back here. Was it to atone for his sins that he was doing out in California? I don't, I don't know. But if anybody's looking for a good research topic, <laughs> Horace, it, Horace is you know wide open. I would love to do some research on him because he really did. He he donated a lot of money um, to, to for the public good, both in the county and in the town of Galway. That it? Right. Oh, well, that one, last one. Go ahead. Well, uh, we have a phrase today, the working poor, that's people who are fully employed but are homeless anyway. And so the question is, could you go out to the poor house and work? And the related question, uh, because what you said, there's an implication that they may have thought that people who are poor were somehow responsible for it, and they were going to prove their character as, 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 as a reason for putting them in the poor house. Okay, so the first question is, was there people who went out from the poorhouse to, that could earn money? Yeah. Um, and, and I think yes. Uh, I think that they were allowed to do that. And the other thing is that um, the county actually paid a salary to some of the inmates, um, their terminology, inmates, um, that, that were able to do tasks such as take care of other inmates. Um, I, I actually have, um, there's a family that I was helping to research uh, their ancestors who were in the poorhouse, a mother and daughter. And I, I found in the Board of Supervisors proceedings, trying to remember the time period, is early 1900s, I found um, her name and that they paid her a salary of $2.50 and the explanation is caring for inmates. So, you know, whether that was um, making beds, helping to feed them, uh, she was obviously c capable enough to do this and she was paid for it. So, so there are instances that the county was paying people who had to stay in the poorhouse for the jobs that they were able to do. All right, repeat your second question. So it's well, gone. Yes. But was it for widespread? You, know, you had to be going into places because that, their culture was superior to someone mm -hmm. who wanted to educate them. So was there a little bit of that? Just what you I think so. Uh, he's asking um, if there was an attitude against people who were able to work but still poor. Uh, and um, I, I think there was. I think that's where you get the term worthy poor versus unworthy poor, that somehow it's their fault for being poor, and if they just stopped their bad habits, uh, they would be able to support themselves. I, I cer we certainly see that early on in the 1820s, 
Uh, I would say the other factor that's a big deal is that there were no safety nets then. Um, we didn't have uh, workman's compensation or unemployment insurance, um, no social security. Those things that came about in the 20th century that made it easier for people to remain in their own homes with public assistance, they didn't exist in the 1800s. So that's why you see, I think, a larger population of poor all grouped into these kind of communal living areas. The ones that were able to work had to work on the farm. The ones that couldn't were still cared for there. But yeah, I think there's an attitude. Yeah. We have a couple of online questions from our online audience. Great. Um, so uh, Tamara asks, uh, we no longer live in San Francisco, but Cal State University is also a place where people can learn more about the publications, photos, stories, interviews, etc. That's the first question. Okay, so the question is, they don't, uh, the, the person who's watching online doesn't live in Saratoga County, and they want to know if there's a way that they can learn more about, you know, records, images, things like that. There are some websites that deal with poorhouse history. Um, the, uh, the, the State Board of Charities reports are available online. Uh, you can certainly read those reports. All of the different county poorhouses are um, inspected in those reports. So you could certainly learn that. Um, I would love to have my whole collection scanned and digitized. We're always working towards goals like that to make uh, records more accessible to the public. I, I hope that one day that will be true. Right now my records are, are not online. Um, if anybody likes volunteering, <laughs> we do have scanning equipment. Um, no, but hopefully that's something we work towards. But yes, there are some online sources. State Board of Charities, are, are, that's, a, that's a good spot to start. And uh, what do you have from the uh, online audience? Uh, do children receive religious instruction or they take them to church or have access to clergy, etc.? So there, yeah, uh, the question is, were children uh, exposed to um, religion? Did they have an opportunity to be taken to church, um, et cetera? They, there were Bibles available. That, that's said over and over again. There were Bibles available for people in the poorhouse, and there were occasional religious services that happened on the premises. So yes, I think there were clergy that visited actually quite often uh, here, and um, I don't know about in the individual orphanages what they were exposed to, but because um, religious groups were so integral in charity uh, and in providing different types of relief, I would imagine that they were all exposed to religion. Okay, last one. Uh, Lauren, I understand that uh, uh, some of these county farms, um, the dairy there was a county farm made an effort to make a good show at county fairs and in competitions and so on about their animal husbandry. Did, did our county farm have anything like that for us? So he's asking if uh, the, the dairy, the farm, had a showing at our county fair. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I have seen several different uh, um, records of, of people winning and I've never seen the, the county poorhouse referred to, but I don't know for sure. I don't know the answer. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Sorry. Well, now I think you know, I think you know now why uh, you're, there's such a crowd here, because Lauren did such a great job. Um, what I would ask you to do on your way out is to stop back, try those cookies, Oh, yeah. If don't you, forget the cookies. Don't forget I, the cookies. I worked really hard on the poorhouse cookies. <laughs> right. Come up and look at the uh, uh, material up here. And we hope.